Good afternoon, well, actually evening officially now. Uh, how are you? Okay, only one person is good. Uh, good evening. All right, how are you guys doing? Okay, that sounds better. Okay, um, are you ready for the last session of the series? Uh, well, so if uh, you are wondering, this is not the last lecture that they will have. Okay, so tomorrow night, if, if you've liked what you've heard here on health, I'm sure you will like what will be presented tomorrow night, uh, which has taken a little different uh, shift. Um, and I would say, if, if any of you know of young people, um, high schoolers, middle school, college kids, you know what is said, the, st the statistics, you can train the young mind in understanding the Bible and creation, but college does a wonderful job at getting God out of their brain. So tomorrow night's talk is creation versus evolution. And um, so if you know some young people, bring them along, invite them. It, it should be another great talk. But uh, back on the gut-brain connection. Oh, and there's some flyers on that. On the way out, uh, you're welcome to uh, grab some and invite a young person or invite yourself. Um, what did you learn last night? What's that? Take vitamin B12, okay? What else did you learn? Plants have neurotransmitters. Very good. One more. Uh, fruit is very good, even for diabetics. So... What I remember, because it reinforced what I had just learned like two weeks ago, is you need to have at least 30 different plant foods per week. Okay. So how many did you have today? All right, you got it six more days, all right. <laughs> all right, uh, well. Let's bow our heads for prayer, and uh, we'll uh, give the podium over. Heavenly Father, it's been uh, a great week, a week of uh, learning and uh, growing, and we thank you for giving us the opportunity to have uh, brought uh, Chad and Fadia Cruiser with us uh, uh, to this place uh, for this week, and we thank you for their ministry and what they are doing, and uh, tonight we just ask a special a blessing upon them as they share and again open our ears and our hearts uh, to what uh, you have here for truth for us for our well-being in Jesus name amen good evening how's everyone doing good can you hear me all right yeah okay good good to go okay wonderful well, tonight we're going to talk about a health food that may make you depressed, angry, and ruin your marriage. But we're not going to start with that. That's coming. That'll be one of the last things in the message. So it's going to be several minutes before we get to that. But I want to start with, if you go online or you listen to or you read books on the microbiome, the bacterial diversity that is within our guts, when you read about the microbiome, one of the most consistent foods you will read about or hear from the medical professionals in the field is this, fermented foods. If, if anybody's into you know, the gut-brain connection, you'll hear fermented foods. But I want to actually look at the research on this. So it is very true that fermented foods are filled with good bacteria generally. But what I'm looking for when I'm looking for health is I'm looking for things that have health benefits without side effects. Are there any side effects to the fermented foods that are so very popular? 
And I've only seen one medical professional even mention it. Now, I had found the research and looked all into it and gather you'll see the research as we look at it. I've read one medical professional that talked about it and then just said, well, you know, yeah, it's not a big deal, but we'll see if it's a big deal and you, you can make your own decision with this. So let's look at, we're going to start with a meta-analysis. That means they gather up as many studies as they can find on a subject. There's a meta-analysis of soy and gastric cancer risk in the journal Cancer Science. Researchers looked at 20 different studies on the consumption of fermented soy products and discovered that fermented soy, which might include tempeh, miso, etc., increased the risk of gastric cancer by 22%. So someone might be thinking, that's right, we should maybe stop eating soy. Well, it turns out non-fermented soy foods lowered risk of gastric cancer by 36%. So when you eat it in its natural unfermented form, it actually, 36%, that's a significant lowering of cancer rates. It lowers it, but when you ferment that exact same food, it has a 22% increased risk of gastric cancer at least looking at these 20 different studies added up. Well, okay, let's go further. There's another kind of fermented food that is probably not as, maybe, maybe some of you eat it, but it's probably not as popular in East Tennessee as it is in maybe South or North Korea. And anybody know what it is? Yes, kimchi. And let's look at kimchi and risk of gastric cancer. Kimchi is a common Korean food often made from fermented cabbage, radishes, and other vegetables. And in a case-controlled study report in the World Journal of Gastroenterology, kimchi was found to increase the likelihood of gastrointestinal cancer. Now, I made a video on this on my YouTube channel, which, once again, by the way, is called Health and Homestead, if you want to check it out. And it, people get furious with me, and I don't mind. I, I don't really mind people getting angry with me. And if you're going to have a YouTube channel, you got to get used to it. And so I, I get people angry with me from time to time. And that's one of the videos people get furious with me. And I'm just reading the research. You can do with it whatever you want. I'll love you either way. I can sit down with my dad, and he can eat his octopus, and I can eat my sweet potato, and we can enjoy each other's company. I'm not someone who hates somebody or just, you know, if you don't eat just like me. And I don't expect you to eat just like me, by the way, either. You get to make decisions with the information that I share. We're looking at research, and you get to make your own decisions, and I'll love you either way. And I don't even get mad at the people who get angry with me. I actually, I kind of get a kick out of it a little bit when they get angry with me, but that's a little side point there. Um, but nevertheless, uh, I, yeah. So back to the point, people say, okay, Chad, but what about the Koreans and the Japanese? They have very low levels of cancer, and that's true except they have the highest rates of gastric cancer in the world. Overall, cancer is very low. But when it comes to the three top countries in the world for gastrointestinal cancer, it's South, it's South Korea, it is Japan, and it is Mongolia. And it's interesting. Yes, they have low rates of cancer overall, but when it comes to the gastric cancer, they're the highest. And so that's an interesting point in and of itself. So... Now, this is another one people get angry with me for because of the title. And I didn't make up the title. This is the actual name of the title in the scientific journal. And you notice it's in quotations because I didn't make up a word of that. The title of it is Pickled Food and Risk of Gastric Cancer, a Systematic Review and Meta-Analysis of the English and Chinese Literature. Now, there's two kinds of pickled food, by the way. When we typically think of pickled food in the United States, we think of putting what with vegetables. But vinegar, maybe vinegar is pretty standard. It could be salt, uh, but we often think of putting it in vinegar. But historically, pickled vegetables, traditionally, they were a fermented food. But I mean, vinegar is a fermented substance also, by the way. But uh, traditionally, they were made, it was a fermented food. Now, a meta-analysis of 60 different studies was conducted looking at pickled vegetables in general, and this is the name in the study, the word, word was pickled. Pickled vegetables in general and gastric, or in cancer risk rather. Overall, the studies revealed pickled vegetables were associated with a 50% increased risk of gastric cancer. Is that significant, yes or no? 
Now, if you come from a family and nobody ever had cancer, you might be like, ah, who cares? My family, we never get cancer. But somebody like me, almost every adult in my family has had cancer. And by the way, my family doesn't live a very healthy lifestyle. There's a lot of obesity. There's overweight. My wife and I, after getting married, we're getting bigger and bigger, and we're feeling worse and worse. And uh, finally, we're just like, man, we got to do something about this. And so by God's grace, we did. And now we found it very easy to keep the weight off and feel phenomenal. And it's not because we have all kinds of willpower. It's just finally we decided, hey, we just can't do this anymore. We don't like feeling sick. Some, some people, like, they just get to a point in their life, they're like, I am sick of feeling sick. And then they feel good when they change their lifestyle. And then it's like, hey, I'm more addicted to feeling good than I am to feeling sick and just eating food that is, you know, not as healthy for me. So it's just been a blessing for us. But nevertheless, back to the point, going even further, this basically they found a study report in the Journal of Nutrition and Cancer showed that vegetable consumption lowers your risk for breast cancer while pickled vegetables increase your chances of having breast cancer. And so, once again, are, are there benefits to pickled or fermented foods? And the answer is yes. They have good bacteria in them. But they also may raise rates of cancer. And for me, that's not a, you know, good risk-benefit. To me, it's like if something's carcinogenic potentially, it's like, well, if I know that, I'm going to do my best to just avoid it. But once again, if you, if you disagree with me and you don't like me because of this, I love you anyway. I'm, I'm not angry with you if you disagree. But what about one of the most popular fermented foods like in the United States, which is sauerkraut and laryngeal cancer? A matched case control study was done looking on the effects of different lifestyle habits as risk factors for laryngeal cancer. It was found that higher sauerkraut consumption is associated with higher rates of laryngeal cancer. So you may say, Chad, but there's benefits to sauerkraut. And I would agree with you. But there also may be a side effect of potential cancer. And so the question is, can we get the benefits without the negatives? And that's what I'm looking for. And we'll get to that in just a moment. But so what are some of the potential causative factors? So researchers have wondered, okay, we get that there's at least a correlation. Now, correlation is not always causation. It doesn't guarantee that these things are causing it. It just says that it's correlated with it. But they do have some potential causative factors that they found. Now, one of them is that there can be mold that takes place in the fermenting process. So there may be mold that you can't even see mixed in there in small quantities. And that may be one of the things that lowers immune function because that is true with like mold in a house. And sadly, I, I would say that Tennessee is the state that I've been to that probably is most prone to mold of any, of any state I've been to. Um, we've been here many times. We go to many different places, whether it's, you know, and it's very common for houses to have mold in them here. And it may not always be seen, but often that musty smells there. It doesn't have to be there, uh, but it's very common. And one of the things that mold does, whether it's in the house or consuming it, mold actually impairs the immune function. It lowers the immune function. And one of the things that fights cancer, the main thing that fights cancer is your immune system. I mean, really, that is what fights cancer. And so what happens is if your immune system is degraded or not on working on all its cylinders, as it were, it cannot, because scientists have suggested that the average person makes somewhere between about two to five cancer cells a day, even if they're not considered to have cancer. And so that being the case, most people, if they have a healthy immune function, our body will destroy those cancer cells and we'll never know about. But if we have a hampered immune function, our body isn't able as well to be able to take out these cancer cells. And so mold is one potential factor. Number two is high salt. Often fermented foods are very high in salt, and salt is also correlated with cancer. Now, that doesn't mean you shouldn't use any salt in your diet. Um, many people will become too low in salt if they don't use it. But most people, if they're eating packaged foods, don't need to add any salt to their diet. Now, if you're eating pure, whole, unrefined plant foods with no salt added, you may need to add a little bit to make sure you have enough sodium. But for most people, if you're eating packaged foods, you're getting plenty of sodium. But in fermented foods, it can be high, and that could be a causative factor. Now, here's some kind of more detail than maybe you're looking for. But in the journal Food Control, 
A study is reported called lactic acid bacteria in kimchi might be a cause for carcinogen production in the intestine. They state that the fermented food evidently causes the gut to produce procarcinogenic enzymes from the lactic acid, two different, uh, two different enzymes that may be carcinogenic. So it may be something that is literally a part of the fermenting process of fermenting vegetables. And so uh, these are some of the things that the researchers suggest. But there's another fermented drink that is much more common than anything we've talked about so far, and that is alcohol. And alcohol is also a fermented food, although it's a drink. And they have found a causal link between alcohol and cancer of the esophagus, larynx, pharynx, mouth, colon, rectum, breast, and liver. So once again, fermented vegetable, which is what alcohol is. And, uh, but there's another very popular drink these days. When I say very popular, that's more relative. Becoming more popular in like health food stores and so forth. Another fermented drink. Anybody have a guess what the name is? It's a funny name. Kombucha. That's right. Kombucha. That's also a fermented drink. And so, uh, you know, people homebrew this stuff, or you can buy it at the health food stores often. And the reason why people take it is they say, well, it's a fermented drink. It has good bacteria in it because it has that good bacteria and it must be good for you. And it would be good for your microbiome to give a diversity of bacteria to the gut. Well, it is reported that people feel good when they drink kombucha. And it is claimed that this is because of antioxidants and other substances. Well, let's look into a little bit. Kombucha is a fermented drink when homebrewed. It typically has between 1% to 2% alcohol, but may reach as high as 3%. And when bought in stores, it's supposed to have no more than a half percent of alcohol, but there's really very little regulators looking into it. So they really you have no idea what percentage alcohol it has. And once again, you're home brewing it. It could be up to 3%. That'd be like drinking a wine cooler. Now, I don't drink anymore, but I used to be a, I used to be a drinker. And can you get drunk on wine coolers? Yes, you can. Would it make sense that drinking kombucha makes people feel good? Yes, it makes tons of sense, right? But now just because something makes you feel good, does that mean it's good for you? Does heroin make people feel good? Methamphetamine makes people feel amazing. Thousand percent increase in dopamine to the brain. I mean, it's unbelievable. Must be good for you then, right? No, it's one of the most worst things in the world, you know, meth. And so the point is just because something makes you feel good and just because something has something good in it, like kombucha, is no guarantee that it's actually good for you because once again, we just found that alcohol is, has a causative link to several different cancers and so we can expect the very same thing from kombucha. And so me, I like to also have my cognition as sharp as possible because every time we drink alcohol, we're killing brain cells. And some of you might be thinking, I got so many brain cells, I could, use, I could lose a few, right? No, probably nobody's thinking that, right? <laughs> we're actually thinking, I want to keep as many as I can because I don't want to, if possible, I'd love to avoid being maybe demented later in life, right? And I don't say that as a joke. I say that very seriously because that's a very serious fear. And the older we get, the more prone we are to dementia. And so one of the things we can do is not destroy intentionally brain cells. So once again, okay, Chad, if, if we're not going to get our good bacteria from kimchi and the, and the you know, cabbage that's in kimchi, where can I get that great lactobacillus bacterium that's in there? Well, guess where it actually comes from? It comes from the cabbage itself. So if you eat the cabbage, you will get the good bacteria that you need. You don't need to ferment it to get the bacteria. God put it right in the food, and so we don't have to ferment it. Now, if you want to, that's up to you. I'm not judging anybody. I'll love you either way. But somebody like me, especially with a background of cancer throughout my family, I'm going to do everything I can to lower the risk in my life. And so I don't think it's actually a healthy way to get the bacteria. I think it's kind of like the good with the bad, the old historic Asian idea of yin and yang, darkness and light dwell together. I'm not looking for darkness and light. I'm looking for light without darkness. 
That's what I'm looking for. The Bible says that in God is light and in him is no darkness at all. In the Garden of Eden, there was a tree of life and there was a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And do we want good and evil or are we just looking for good? I, personally, I want the good, I want the light. And once again, we all get to make our own decisions. And so where do we get the good bacteria? Eating a diversity of plant foods will give us the diversity of bacteria that we need. So it just goes back to that simple answer. You don't have to go buy some pills and try to get the bacteria. You can get it right in your apples and your peaches and your plums and your kale and your spinach or whatever. You can get it from these foods. Now, we're going to take a little parentheses for a moment and kind of hit another issue. And this is body mass index in the USA from 1870 to 2013. And I could probably add each year after that, but this particular study was just till 2013. So that's, that's the chart I have, but I probably should update it. We could probably get the data till 2022 or something like that. But um, nevertheless, how are we doing? Now, just so that you understand, BMI is not a perfect reference of health because somebody could be very, very strong and technically overweight, but most people aren't that way. Uh, but it's basically a measure of how much you weigh for, for your height. And anything 25 and above is considered overweight. Once you hit 30, it's in the realm of obesity. And once you hit 35, it's morbidly obese. So these terms like obese, these aren't like just like in, insults from your doctor. These are mathematical equations, right? Uh, you know, when, when a doctor says that, they're not, they're not being, using pejorative language. It, it's just a mathematical equation. And so, but I want to look at where Americans were in 1870 to 2013. The average American in 1870 was a BMI of maybe 22 and a half. They were somewhere around my size. Now I look strange and like, like I'm dying or something from lack of food, but I'm not dying, I assure you. Uh, but, you know, back then it was pretty normal, right? But now it's thoroughly abnormal. It's actually very unusual to be within the normal BMI. And what has happened? What has caused this great change to take place in the United States and many wealthier countries of the world? Now, the thing that you hear blamed most on the internet and in the lines of the grocery stores on the magazines there is a four-letter word that starts with a C. I guess it's five if you add an S on the end. What is that word? Carbs. Carbs are the, the devil's food, people would make us believe, right? It's all because of carbs that everybody's gaining weight. So let's ask the question, is that true? And the worst of all carbs is suggested is wheat, bread. Bread is the reason Americans are overweight. That is the culprit. Okay, are carbs the problem? Let's look at the research, not the popular, you know, news articles or the popular influencers on, on the internet. And by the way, I'm on YouTube. I'm not putting people down just because they're on YouTube. Um, we get made fun of pretty good anyway, and I don't mind, like I said. But nevertheless, are carbs the problem? Are carbs the problem? Let's look at the data. Okay, let's look from 1909 to the year 2008. Just once again, this is how long this study was. So uh, I, we could update it too, but this is where they were in this particular study. So this is, we're going to start off looking at flour grains, like flour, like bread, what makes bread, and cereal consumption. And, when, and we, we say it's cereal grains, and I don't mean Lucky Charms. We are talking about oats and grains. This is what we're talking about, cereal grains, okay? So we're going to start off with that and ask the question, are Americans eating a ton more bread today than they used to? Well, let's find out. Back in the year 1909, Americans were eating over 300 pounds of wheat and grains per year, per person. That's almost a pound a day of, of flour. Now, obviously, they were cooking it into something, but the whole point is it was a massive portion of their diet. And were they heavier back then? I mean, they must have been massive back then with all that bread they were eating. Can you imagine? Now, what did the research show us about at that time? Everybody was thin and trim when they were eating a ton of bread. What's happening?
Yes. By the way, this is interesting. What people will show you is this right here. They will start the chart right here and they won't show you all this. They'll say, look, since 1975, we're eating more grains and we're fatter and fatter. That's the cause of our obesity problem. Now, okay, that looks pretty good, but the trouble is when we ate way more than this, when we ate 100 pounds more than this a year, we were thinner. So something's not adding up to the popular YouTubers and the popular influencers. There must be more to the story. Well, let's keep going. What about, there's another terrible, terrible food out there called potatoes. Those are carbs, and that's probably making everybody overweight too, right? They probably hardly ate them back then, huh? Well, let's find out. We used to eat 200 pounds of potatoes a year, and now we eat about 125 pounds a year, and we must be losing tons of weight because of this, right? No, we're getting bigger and bigger and bigger. As we eat less bread, as we eat less potatoes, we get bigger and bigger. That's interesting. How about sweet potato consumption? Well, we used to eat, I don't know, 25, 30 pounds a year, and now we eat just north of zero. So it must not be sweet potatoes. They must not be the problem either then. How about let's look at cheese consumption. Do you think we're eating less or more cheese than we used to? <laughs> well, okay, there, there, there's a little change. That's a little different, don't you think? We hardly used to eat the stuff 100 years ago. I mean, less than five pounds a year. I mean, it was a little garnish you'd have on very special occasions. It was not a staple in the American diet. Now it is on almost everything. It's on with almost every meal. And there's even something in the, in the grocery stores, you may have heard of it, it's called the cheese effect. And you know what the cheese effect is? Do you know where they put generally cheese in grocery stores? In the back of the store. Because they know you're going to go to the back of the store. They don't want you just going to the front and missing everything else. You're going to go to the back of the store. So you got those dairy products right in the back because that's the cheese effect. You're going to go get that cheese. They know that, right? Now, some of us don't eat cheese. I, I loved cheese, but um, I never, you know, I, I ate, that was the first food that I ever noticed in my life that after I ate a bunch of pizza, I loved pizza, by the way, but I always noticed I really didn't feel all that great about a half hour later. I just, my mind wasn't as clear. I just didn't feel as good. And I'm surprised that I even had that much, you know, perception because I didn't notice anything about anything when it came to food. But that slight thing I did notice. So what about, let's look at some things like beef, pork, chicken, and turkey consumption. When we look at beef, we do eat a little more. This is once again what they do is they go to 1975 and they say, look, they say, you know, the one with uh, bread, we were eating more since 1975, and beef, we're eating less, and we're getting fatter. So it's not the beef. That's kind of the argument. They say we should go back to more beef and less bread, and then we'll be thinner. That's kind of the idea, but, well, there's more to the story. How about pork? Eh, it's about the same. Americans aren't. It's not a health food at all, by the way. There's nothing healthy about pork. But chicken, what about chicken consumption? This one's kind of surprising. We eat way more chicken than we used to. And so, and you might be thinking, well, Chad, but that's because chicken's like the, the, the lean meat, and so it's better for you. That was true 100 years ago, that chicken was a lean meat 100 years ago. But we have selectively bred chickens so that now chicken can be just as fat as like a dozen different cuts of steak, or beef, rather. Meaning it's just as fat. We've selectively bred the chickens to be fatter and fatter and fatter and fatter and fatter. So because of that, chicken legs aren't really chicken legs anymore. <laughs> Meaning they're not skinny like they used to be. Times have changed. And uh, then what about turkey? Yeah, we eat a little bit more than we used to. We're not massive turkey eaters. That's generally kind of a hol holiday thing for Americans. But what about, what do you think about sugar consumption? Okay, well, let's find out. <laughs> we eat massively more sugar than we did in 1820. In 1820, now this goes back even further, um, Americans hardly ate sugar. Sugar was such a specialty item, probably on a holiday here and there. You know, on some of the very special holidays, you'd have something with sugar in it. Food was just food back then, right? 
You didn't have all these additives like we do. So how many calories per day is the average American eating of sugar? It's right around 300 calories per day. Now, keep that in mind. This next one is even more surprising how many calories. Now, sh sugar is basically you're taking a plant and you're extracting only the carbohydrates out of it. There's no fiber and there's virtually no other vitamins or minerals, or at least very little, right? That's what sugar is, purely refined food. There's another refined food that we actually eat way more of than sugar. What is that? It's interesting. It is, this is vegetable oil consumption. In the United States, we eat 700 calories per day of oil. That's more than twice the amount of sugar we eat every day. And we normally feel good about it because we're constantly told, Get your good fat, get your good fat, get your good fat, get your good fat. And so because of that, the two most refined foods in the American diet are sugar and oil. And together, how many calories is that in a day? A thousand calories of purely refined food. Now, by the way, you might be saying, Chad, are you saying it's a sin to eat sugar and oil? No, it's not a sin. It's just these two foods are the greatest cause of the weight problem in the United States today. Because you can eat these foods mixed into other foods and they add almost no space to the stomach. Basically, your stomach tells you you're full when you've stretched out the stretch receptors to a certain capacity. But oil and sugar is so small that it doesn't even hardly make a difference to the stretch capacity. So we can easily add a thousand calories to our diet every single day. And because of that, we've become one of the most obese countries in the world. I don't say that to put anybody down. It's just a fact. My wife and I, we got married. We're getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And because uh, we were, you could say, delighting ourselves in fatness, we were eating this food and getting bigger and bigger and bigger and feeling, like we said, worse and worse and worse. Now, I'm not telling you you have to do it, but if you simply cut those two things out of your diet, oil and, fat, oil and sugar, you would lose a thousand calories a day you know what a pound of fat, how many calories are in a pound of fat? 3,500. Every three and a half days, you would lose a pound. Every week, you would lose, and this is roughly because there's some, some other things that can affect weight loss, but you would lose weight. And so you would lose roughly every week two pounds without doing anything else to your diet. Now, I'm not saying you have to do this, but what I am saying is that it makes it easy to just shed weight when we go on a whole food, non-refined diet. It just falls away. And so you can still eat till you're comfortably full. That's the cool thing about it. Yes, and we're going to see that in just a moment, the effect of these things on the brain also. So I'm not saying you have to do this, but what I am saying, going on something like the therapeutic diet, like we've talked about, which is a whole food, plant-based diet that is it can literally, you can eat till you're comfortably full at mealtimes. And if you don't eat between meals, which is best not to, if you don't eat between meals, what ends up happening is you will lose weight without even trying, without even exercise. You don't even need to exercise. Right? Although don't get me wrong, exercise is wonderful for your brain. We've seen that, right? Lowers levels of depression. It's fantastic for you. But it's not actually all that good at helping you lose weight. As we said, it takes 35 miles to walk to lose one pound. And so just cutting these two things out of the diet, going on a whole food diet for a very short time can, in most cases, cutting these two things out of your diet will literally reverse diabetes very rapidly and it makes you simply feel better. Once again, not telling you you have to, we're just looking at the scientific data that's actually out there. So I just want to give you an idea how this works. My wife and I call this a full factor. We just have a few slides on this here. We have a whole message on this where we go into a lot of data, but we won't do that. This is basically about, that's your stomach. And that's about 500 calories of oil in your stomach. Would, would that fill you up? No, and nobody would just drink it like that unless you're listening to Dr. Gundry and he tells you just drink the stuff, right? Um, don't listen to Dr. Gundry, folks. Uh, but aside, he's a fantastic marketer. The guy's a champion of marketing. His, the research just doesn't always back up what he says. Some of it does, some of it doesn't. It's kind of, he's a wild card there. He's got all kinds of ideas. Uh, but this idea of drinking oil is it's not, not the best thing to do, but nevertheless. So here is 500 calories of something like beef. That wouldn't fill you up. Here's 500 calories of chicken. And this is 500 calories of a diversity of vegetables. 
Would that fill you up? Yes. And if you added the oil to it, it wouldn't really add any space at all because it would just it would just fill in the holes. And as a result, what would happen to the meal? It would double in calories. It's not a sin to do that, by the way. It's not a sin to do it. I'm not saying I'm not putting anybody down for doing it. But often it's very common for women to go out with their husbands. Their husband gets a steak. The wife gets a salad and she says, look at him. He's doing fine and I'm the one gaining weight all the time. Why is it? It's because what's on top of it that's actually, it's the most calorie-dense food in the world. So you get the idea. I'm not telling you you have to get rid of it. You say, Chad, where would we get our good fat? You'll get it in every plant food that you'll eat. You can have, you can have if, if you wanted to go on the diet to lose weight and to reverse disease, you could go, you know, you could eat the olives, you could eat a handful of nuts a day. You'd get all, from, from one handful of nuts a day, you'll get all the good, good fat you need anyway. So you don't have to really worry about it. It's not that hard. And you'll get it in your, I mean, literally, even though you look at an apple, if you look at the nutrition facts, it will say like no fat. But if they're honest, they'll show you the actual amount. In every plant food, there is some good fat and you will get adequate amounts. They've even done studies where they feed people like 2% fat and they do perfectly fine. The Okinawans were one of the longest living cultures on planet Earth. 85% of their diet was carbohydrate and only 6% of their diet was fat. And they kept their cognition until 100 years old. And they were sharp as a tack, even into their elderly years. But we're constantly being told, get the good fat, get the good fat, get the good fat. So we're just dumping it on, dumping it on. And even if you're not dumping it on, it's in the potato chips, it's in the tortilla chips, it's in all the packaged foods. And so it just adds up over the course of a day. Once again, it's not a sin to eat it. It is just these two foods together, these two refined foods make up a thousand calories of our diet. And many times we don't even, we don't add them. Like most people aren't dumping sugar on their food. Some, some people are. Most people aren't even dumping a ton of oil on. It's just mixed in everything that we eat. And so because of that, we don't even notice it. But I want to give you just a little idea about this. Here's calories per pound. Now in the potatoes, one pound of potatoes is 320 calories. If you turn that potato into a tater tot, it becomes 906 calories per pound. Now what tripled the calories in the potato? It's the oil, right? Now, what if you turn that into a potato chip? How many calories per pound? 2,400 calories per pound. You get the idea. The more we process something, and, and people look at that and they're like, I can't eat potato chips. I, I, that's too many carbs. And it's actually majority fat. It's actually more, it's 50% or more fat and it's less carbs. So it's not actually a, a carb. I mean, yeah, there's some carbs in there, but it's mainly a fat. What about this? What about, we're not talking about the, the cob, but the actual corn, 400 calories per pound. You turn that into a tortilla and it's 990 calories per pound. It's not a sin to eat tortillas. Uh, we're just showing you what happens through processing. And what happens if you turn it into uh, something called Fritos? You know what Fritos are? The, the corn chips, right? Tasty little buggers. What happens? 2,560 calories per pound, right? And you say, but Chad, it's vegan. It is. I actually think it's vegan foods that are making, and I don't mean vegans, because vegans are actually the thinnest people on average, but vegan food is actually making meat eaters often overweight. What do I mean by that? Because something like this is filled with oil, and it's making people, you can consume in a small quantity, tons of calories. And so we don't catch that. This is what is often happening. So we're done. I want to get done with this and we'll get on to our next point. But this gives you a little idea how many calories per pound. So vegetables, things like broccoli, around 160 calories per pound. One of the great weight loss foods, you know, you can cook it, you know and add a little salt to it, it doesn't add any calories. Then you move on to the apples, it's like 240 calories per pound. Fruit's one of the best. Vegetables are the number one food to make you lose weight. Number two, fruit is the second greatest food to make you lose weight. And uh, number three, you go on to oats, something like oatmeal, 300 calories per pound. You go on to potatoes, we just mentioned they were 300 and some for potatoes, 400 for sweet potatoes per pound. And then beans, roughly 550 there for the beans. And if you eat a diversity of fruits, vegetables, grains, 
uh, potatoes, sweet potatoes, beans, uh, you know, rice, these kind of things. You eat a diversity of those, and you know, you can season it, these kind of things, and you can cook it. These foods help us to just lose weight without even trying. But it's the additives that we add to it, whether it's butter or oil, these kind of things can help us gain weight. If, and sometimes you may need to gain weight. And so that's where the refined foods can help you gain weight. Uh, but nevertheless, then once you get up to like chicken, 1,000 calories per pound, beef, 1,300, pork, 1,400 per pound. But then what has even more? Cheese, 1,800 calories per pound, but which is significant because we're eating way more of that. And But even more than that are the chips, right? Potato chips, tortilla chips, the Fritos we mentioned, 2,400, 2,500 calories per pound. These are amazing weight-gaining foods, and they're really tasty, and that's why we like to eat them, and, you know, we do. But nothing helps us gain weight more than the oil because it is the most calorie-dense food in the world. And so if somebody's looking to gain weight, that is a way to do it. And so it also can clog up the, uh, the muscle cells and liver cells, increasing rates of diabetes. And so once again, not a sin to eat it. I'm just letting you know, kind of looking at the research there on something that's taking place in the weight gaining issues. And so the gut-brain connection is when we stretch the stretch receptors in the gut, it tells the brain, I'm full. And so if, like the people like myself, I bet if I went out to eat with you, I'd eat more food than you. I'd eat more food than almost any human you know. And my wife would too, my little old wife. We go out to eat, and I'll be totally honest, when my dad, he's, you know, obese, we go out to eat, and we, uh, we ate the same meal with him. We were working with him on reversing type 2 diabetes, and we bought bean burritos. He ate the whole thing, and he said, oh, no, I ate the whole thing. That was too much. And I said, Dad, I ate the whole thing. Fadi ate the whole thing. And we're saying, that's not that much. It's not a big deal. But we're used to eating a lot of food. Because the food we ate has so many, so little calories that, you know, you just you stay thin and trim and you don't even have to worry about it. And he thought, oh, no, this is going to be terrible. My blood sugar is going to be horrible tomorrow morning. He wakes up the next morning. It had been four days of changing his diet. The fifth morning was the first time in his life he'd ever seen a normal blood sugar. And the point is, these whole foods are so powerful at helping reverse disease that you can eat them till you're comfortably full and not feel bad about it. You don't even have to feel bad. And by the way, when you eat them whole, they'll finally tell you, stop eating. You'll be like, okay, I'm done. Your body just tells you. But when we add all the, the refined foods, it's hard to stop. It's really hard to stop. But nevertheless, I want to transition to intestinal permeability. Many studies have come out on intestinal permeability over the last decade or so. It's also called leaky gut. And just to give you an idea of how this works, you have in your intestines, or intestines, this would be the wall, the lining of the intestines. So the, the bottom wall would be here, up here somewhere would be the top wall. And basically, so our, our intestines are a tube, and lining that tube, you have the, this, these epith this epithelial layer of cells. And these cells are supposed to block the basically your feces, but undigested proteins, things called endotoxins. These cells are supposed to block that from just going right into the bloodstream. And this is, this is the blood vessel right here. So their job is to have these junctions like this, these normal tight junctions. And so nice and tight so that the pathogens that are in our intestines don't just pass right through. But what happens is, with certain things in our diet or lifestyle, it can open up the junctions of the intestines and it, can, it causes inflammation as the pathogens begin to pass right through. And this is called transcellular. Uh, they're make, it's making a transcellular path through the cell itself and the paracellular movement is between the cells where the junctions are broken like over here and these pathogens just come right through over here. So this is what is, you may have heard that term leaky gut, but the research, they actually, in the research and the scientific studies, they call it both leaky gut and increased intestinal permeability. And so now they found in research, looking at this, research reported in internal and emergency medicine reveals that certain substances can produce, the, uh, can produce this uh, leakiness in the gut and which are supposed, these, these um, 
these junctions are supposed to be tightly connected, but they can be caused to be opened and leak, as in the term leaky gut. And some of the causes of leak, leaky gut in the, in the re research literature, in that particular uh, review there of the scientific literature, include things like infections from bacteria that can open up the junctions. A high-fat diet can open up the junctions. Alcohol can do the same. Allergens, so if you're allergic to certain foods or, or even maybe allergies in general may do it. High refined sugar content or high sodium content. So all these different things can open up the junctions of the gut and make us more prone to having intestinal trouble. You may not even have pain. You might have things like flatulence or gas all the time and not know what's going on. And if you have serious gas all the time, that is a sign that something's not right in your intestines. Uh, one of the things you can do if you don't change your diet is simply chewing much more. And by the way, I don't mean you have to chew 40 times either. When we mention that, we're just looking at the study. They just found the more you chew, the more nutrition you get out of it. I don't chew 40 times every time. Uh, but the point is, the more you chew, the better it is for you. And so, you know, chew till you're comfortably comfortable with it. And, uh, but nevertheless, so let's, okay, we're talking about intestinal permeability, also called leaky gut. Because once again, these pathogens are leaking right into the bloodstream. This causes inflammation in the gut. Then it causes uh, disturbance to the brain. And this is this negative gut-brain connection. You follow? Okay. Now, check this out. Marital arguments and leaky gut. Did they actually study this? Sure enough, they did. In the journal Psychoneuroendocrinology, researchers found increased intestinal permeability in couples who had more hostile marital disagreements. That's their wording, hostile marital disagreements. Now, we would just call those arguments, right? Uh, but, you know, in science, they have to sound more proper when they speak there. But nevertheless, so what did they find? They found that husbands and wives who were more into arguing that they had more of these junctions opening in the intestines, which would have been simultaneously caused, causing pathogens to get into the bloodstream, would have been causing inflammation, and this potentially could be causing this you know, trouble to the brain, and it actually may be stemming, the arguments may be actually stemming, not even from here, but from here. Okay, so are there any other foods other than, you know, high fat, high sugar, uh, pathogens, and these kind of things? Are there any other things that we could be eating that could be increasing intestinal permeability or leaky gut? This is actually what we're going to talk about tonight. This is what you were coming for, for the title. Can spices impact character? I'm going to show you a bunch of studies. And once again, if you hate me after tonight and you're angry as can be, I'll just say, well, he was just eating too much spice today, right? No, I'll love you either way. No judgment, but check this out. Researchers discovered that people perceive, they believe, that individuals who like spicy food were more prone to risk-taking. So they investigated and found that people who do enjoy spicy food do indeed tend to enjoy risks more than those who are not spice eaters. Well, correlation is not always causation. So they set up a study to put it to the test. And they had people eat spicy food, and then they took a psychological experience called the Iowa, a uh, psychological experiment rather, called the Iowa gambling task. And it turned out that eating spicy food increased the individual's risk taking. So it may impact character. Okay, that's simple. Giving people spicy food makes them do something that's more risky. All right, we're, we're just showing it may impact character, but we're going to go further. What about intestinal permeability and certain spices? In the Journal of Nutrition, in a study in the Journal of Nutrition, researchers looked at the impact of certain spices on intestinal permeability or leaky gut. And it revealed that certain spices, including cayenne, paprika, and chili, can increase intestinal permeability. Now, that's interesting. So these spices, as we eat them, now I don't know, the, the one that is very surprising to me is paprika, because, but it may be this, I don't know, I wasn't able to find out in the study, but paprika comes in two forms. There's a spicy paprika and a non-spicy paprika. And so I don't know if in the study they were using the spicy one or the non-spicy one, I don't know. But 
yeah, that's that was what the study found. But also, obviously, cayenne and and, ch and chili powder can increase intestinal permeability. Well, let's go even further. What about aggression and certain spices? Three studies were reported in the Journal of Experimental and Social Psychology looking at spicy food intake and what they call trait aggression. The, the first study found that those who like spicy food have more trait aggression. But as we already said, correlation is not always causation. So they conducted two additional studies and found that consumption of more versus less spicy food evidently led to higher rates of aggressive cognition as well as perceiving others to be more aggressive. What that means is, as you feed people spicy food, they begin to have more aggressive thoughts. But not only do they become more prone to being aggressive themselves, they think that other people are being more aggressive toward them, even if they're not being more aggressive toward them. Does that make sense? You said that to make me angry. Well, maybe not. Maybe they didn't. Maybe it's actually something going on in here that is causing inflammation that is negatively impacting the mind and making you feel like somebody is trying to make you angry. This is incredible. By the way, we talked about a prison last night who went, they changed the diet of the prisoners and it dropped the recidivism rate, the re-offense rate by 93%, from 95% down to 2%. And looking at that, they went on a diet, a healthy plant-based diet in that situation. But notice what they chose to do because of this research. This next slide is because of this study right here that we just looked at about spicy food making people more aggressive. The study points out that the Malaysian prison system feeds their prisoners non-spicy food to help lower their levels of aggression. Isn't that interesting? So you can actually help change prisoners once again by changing their diet. And by the way, some of you might be thinking, yeah, this kid up there telling us about spicy food, you didn't, you didn't grow up enjoying spicy food. I love spicy food. I grew up eating some of the spiciest food, at least it was the spiciest food that I had ever heard of at the time, called habaneros. Now, there's hotter peppers, but I had never heard of them when I was a kid, so I didn't know about the other ones. But habaneros make a jalapeno seem like a carrot. Yes or no? Yes, extremely spicy. Extremely spicy. And so, yes, I love spicy food. And I'll tell you, I was one of the most aggressive human beings I've ever met in my life. One of the most angry people I've ever met. I would just get furious with people in public. Somebody looked at me, I would just get angry. Um, not with ladies so much, but the guys, obviously, right? And uh, so I would get angry with guys. I mean, it was just a regular occurrence. But I want to show you this guy. Anybody know who that is? Looks like a friendly chap, doesn't he? Well, he's one of the top two mass murderers in all of human history, right? Mao Zedong, right? And true story, a man from East Germany, by the way, East Germans were historically not known for eating spicy food. And there was a man, East German, when, you know, East Germany got annexed to Russia. You remember after World War II, and so East Germany, the eastern part of Berlin, you know, the Berlin Wall, you've been, you, you know about that. I've been to East Germany. There have been, obviously, West Germany too. But uh, nevertheless, you, this man named Otto Braun was, became a liaison between East Germany and China, specifically liaison between East Germany and Mao. And he tells a personal experience that he had with Mao. He says, for example, Otto Braun said, for a long time I could not accustom myself to the strongly spiced food such as hot fried peppers, which is traditional in southern China, especially in Hunan, Mao's birthplace. Mao said to Otto, the food of the true revolutionary is the red pepper. He also said, and he who cannot endure red peppers is also unable to what? Fight. He said, you want to be a good fighter, you got to be eating some spicy food. Isn't that interesting? Now, it's an anecdotal story, but now we have research to back it up. I've been even told that in uh, Jamaica, some folks like to, you know, fight dogs. And one of the things they do to get their dogs riled up is before they'll feed them a bunch of spicy food and get them ready to fight. And so the king of Thailand, this is fascinating. Looking back in history, there was a time when the king of Thailand actually outlawed spicy food in Thailand 
because he said he, it was negatively affecting the character of the Thai population. Now, is, Th is Thailand known for being non-spicy today? No, it's one of the spiciest places in the world. Often when you try to force people to do something, it backfires and gets worse than ever, right? And so they're probably one of the top two or three places in the world for spices. And um, going even further, what about spices and alcohol addiction? In the journal Psychiatry Investigation, researchers looked at people's preference for spicy food and also their genetics. In the conclusion of the study, they state a strong preference for spicy food can be assumed to be a risk factor for alcohol dependence. That's their words. A strong preference for spicy food can also be assumed to be a risk factor for alcohol dependence. We're going to talk more about why in just a moment. In a study in the British Medical Journal of nearly a half a million people, it was found that those who ate more spicy food smoked more tobacco and drank more alcohol. Interesting. Now, why might this be? Okay, if it's troubling the intestines, it troubles the brain, could it be making people more depressed? So then they go looking for alcohol and tobacco and other drugs. Well, let's look at the research. Spicy depression. A study of 1,771 college students tested with the DASS, or the Depression and Anxiety Stress Scale, found that the consumption of spicy food was associated with depression symptoms, with more spice connected to more depression. Even just one or two days a week increased the chances of people being depressed. Incredible. Well, the same study found that eating spicy food greater than or equal to three days a week increased the chances of struggling with anxiety by 50%. 50%. Well, so... It's interesting because America did not used to be a spicy country overall. When I was a kid, 40-some years ago, when I was very young, we weren't big on spices. We started getting a little older. You started having more of that. And then, you know, by the time I'm a teenager, we're eating, you know, super hot food by that, the spicy buffalo hot wings, you know, and these kind of things. And so eating the hot ones, the flaming wings, you know, and these kind of things. And so it began to come in, and now it's almost ubiquitous, right? People who didn't like it now love it. And uh, are we also seeing skyrocketing rates of things like anxiety, depression? Are we seeing society becoming friendlier and friendlier? No, we're not seeing that. You're saying, Chad, you say it's only spices? No, I think there's multiple factors. Social media addiction is making kids depressed. Not getting outside and exercising is making kids... There, there's multiple factors. I don't want to act like it's, you know, unidirectional. This is a, this is, there's multiple factors, for sure, for sure. But I believe actually one of them is that we're eating more and more spicy food, and this is something that can negatively impact. Yes, yes, I'll get to that in just a moment. We'll tell our story. So now, the other thing that spicy food can do is it can increase... How would we say it? We'll just call it from a biblical term. It can massively increase levels of lust. And you look around the world at countries that are very spicy. And for instance, Thailand is one of the sex centers of the world. That's where everybody goes for any kind of sex that they could possibly want, right? You look at countries. I went to a country, it wasn't there. It was another country known for very spicy food. And when I got there, I figured sexual abuse of children and, and uh, you know, all these kind of rape and these, I, fig I figured this was probably very popular, but I didn't know the statistics. And I was speaking next to a, uh, one of the largest hospitals in the world, and we had a number of nurses and doctors who were working there uh, listening to the talk. And one of the pediatricians came to me after the meeting, and he said something fascinating. He said, in this country, the official statistics on child abuse in this fashion that I've just mentioned is that about 50% of children are abused this way. He said, but I'm a pediatrician. I work with children every day, day in, day out. He said, I believe the numbers are way off. He said, I think it's closer to 80 to 95% of children. And in that same country, I asked a friend who, from the United States who had worked there. I said, hey, did you know about all the abuse and rape and so forth that goes on in this country? And my friend said, yeah, we heard about it. And my wife went and asked one of the women there. And she said, is it true that so many women are raped in this country? And the woman's response who lived there and grew up there, she said, I do not know a woman who has not been raped. Now, 
once again, it can increase what we would call like, they used to call like 100 years ago, like animal passions. We would call it today like our, our lusts and cravings and these kinds of things. And here's research on intestinal permeability and recent suicidal behavior. A small preliminary study has reported that in those who recently had suicidal behavior, there was a statistical increase in their levels of intestinal permeability. And this may be one of the factors in inflammation in people with emotional health issues. Now, I want to read to you two quotes before finishing this, and, and we'll go through just a couple other things before we close. This is interesting. We're told here, spices at first irritate the tender coating of the stomach, and, but finally destroy the natural sensitiveness of this delicate membrane. That's what we saw in that chart giving you an idea. The membrane in the intestines becomes inflamed, right? It says the blood becomes fevered. Another word for fevered would be inflamed. The animal propensities are aroused while the moral and intellectual powers are weakened and become servants to the baser passions. That's exactly what we see in the research. We're also told a similar condition is produced under the irritating influence of fiery spices. With the stomach in such a state, there's a craving for something more to meet the demands of the appetite, something stronger and still stronger. This is exactly my testimony. Next, you'll find your sons out on the street learning to smoke. What does that have to do with spicy food? Well, we just saw the research actually tells us there is that, that connection. It is a grievous lesson. It makes them deathly sick, yet they press the matter through with a perseverance that would be praiseworthy and a better cause. Tobacco weakens the brain and paralyzes its fine sensibilities. Its use excites a thirst for strong drink and in very many cases lays the foundation for the liquor habit. That's exactly my testimony. So as I began to eat more spicy food, I began to get more angry, you know, had emotional issues, went into smoking, became a drinker, drugs, and so forth. And it's interesting because could it be once again, and I'll tell you what, so my wife and I, let me tell you why I'm sharing this, not to just try to put down spicy food, because my wife and I liked spicy food so much. You know what we had as the food at our wedding? We had Thai food at our wedding. And then we got married. And by the way, we were like best friends before we got married. Literally, we were best friends. And then we got married. And after a while, we were arguing every day. And you think, oh, you didn't like each other. No, we did. It's just that the smallest things would just annoy us and we would get angry. The word Fadia used another night was peevish. Easily irritated, especially by unimportant things. Things that didn't even matter. We just get annoyed with the other one. We get frustrated. And uh, I'm not proud of this. I wish it wasn't true. And we were trying to follow Jesus. So we were reading our Bibles every single day. We knew the Bible said, do not let the sun go down on your wrath or on your anger. And so every night we'd apologize before we went to bed. And we'd be like, Lord, please help us to stop doing this. And then the next day we'd argue again. We did this virtually every day, almost every day, I would say for years. And we didn't want to be this way. We didn't like it. We came from families like this. And we thought we're not going to do that. And now we're doing it. You know, and we're like, man, this is not good. So after a number of years of doing this, we decided, we had seen like the, this quote here and so forth, and we decided like, hey, what would happen if we just cut spices out of our diet? Let's just see what happens. And uh, so we cut it out, and the next day, we argued just as much as the day before. And the next day, and the next day, and the next, and probably the next. And somewhere around like a week to two weeks, maybe 10 days, we started to calm down. We started to become patient. And now the things that had formerly made us angry, now we would just kind of chuckle at it and laugh. It was wonderful. And our marriage got better and better and better. And so we stuck with it for a month. And then you think, you think we said, hey, let's celebrate and go eat some spicy food. No, we're like, hey, this is great. Let's just keep going. And so we went another week and another and finally got to two months. And then uh, some folks we were trying to, you know, connect with, they said, hey, they were Indian. And they said, you want to go out to Indian food? And I love Indian food anyway. And so, yeah, sure, we'll go with you. And we went out and it was, there's different levels of spice in India. The hottest area of India is an area called Andhra. And that's the hottest. And, and I've been there and I've eaten the spiciest food of India. And I can handle it as far as in my mouth. And uh, so we ate it there as we were out to eat. This is in the United States at the moment, though. And you know what happened that night? We're just as friendly as the day before. You think, Chad, this isn't really working with what you're trying to build a case here, and now you just ruined it. You ruined the whole story of the night. Well, what happened was the next day, I, the next morning, 
I spoke totally rudely to my wife. And then later that day, actually not much longer after that, she, somebody, we were, we were staying with somebody, and they had unplugged the Instant Pot that she was cooking stuff in, and she didn't know where, what time it was turned off. She didn't know how long it was cooked. And when she saw it, and it wasn't me, but she was angry. She was like, what were they thinking? And nobody was around, but she was so angry in her heart. She was frustrated, and she's like, Lord, why am I so angry? This is crazy. I'm like irrational in my head. What's going on? And later in the day, she told me the story. And later in the day, I, got, I was rude to her again, spoke rudely to her. And uh, she said to me the second time, she said, why are you doing this? And I thought about it. I thought, yeah, we haven't done this in a long time. And I said, you know what we ate yesterday, don't you? And she said, no. I said, I think so. Now, we have tried this over and over and over and over with nearly 100% correlation in our marriage. And this is what I mean. The reason why people don't make the correlation in their own life is because you think, oh, if I eat it, boom, right after I should feel it. But do you immediately after eating go to the bathroom and everything falls out that you just ate? No. Sorry for the graphic illustration. Uh, but no, it takes time for it to slowly move. First, it has to go to the stomach. Then it moves through the, you know, the small intestine to the large intestine. It slowly, and, and depending on how fast your transit time is, it should be about 24 hours or so. But some people, it takes days to move through there. They, got, they don't eat any fiber, so it might stay in there a week or two for some folk. And uh, so it slowly moves through the intestines, causing that inflammation to the lining of the gut. And so what happens is it doesn't happen immediately. And it doesn't go away the day that you stop eating because you still have it in you the next day. And so what happens is it caused that inflammation. Just like, let's say I didn't see this table here and I'm running along here and I accidentally kick it with my shin. Oh, I took over the podium. But I accidentally kick, kick the podium, and not the podium, the table here, and, and I cut my shin open. What will happen is you'll begin to have inflammation around it and the body tries to heal. If it's cut open, though, tomorrow morning after I kicked it tonight, would it be fully healed? Well, how about the next day? It'll take several days for it to heal. Same thing happens in our gut. So when we stop eating it, it doesn't go away typically in a day or two or even three. It takes days, and that's why nobody makes the correlation because it's a delayed reaction in healing and a, de a delayed reaction even in eating. And so that's why people don't make the correlation. And by the way, I'm not saying you have to do this, but I know there are marriages. We have, we have shared this around the world now, and we have had people come to us. I can think of one we just visited recently who said in their house, they said dad would be eating spicy food, and he'd be getting frustrated with the kids. He'd be getting frustrated around the house. And when he'd eat spicy food, they'd say, watch out, dad just had some spicy food. And they noticed. And so he finally just stopped eating spicy food, and now they have a happier family. We had a couple... Uh, in Brazil. They actually work in the United States, but built a beautiful house in the mountains of, of, of Brazil. And nevertheless, they, they told us a story personally. They, I hadn't told them about the research. I hadn't told the re them about the research. They had lived in India, and they were cooking a standard Brazilian meal. They don't eat a lot of spices in Brazil. Brazil is not, com it's not common there. So they're eating their normal Brazilian meal in India, and they were having an Indian doctor over. And as they're eating the meal, he looks at it, and all food in, in India is like yellow because, you know, potatoes are yellow. Everything's yellow because it has all the spices on it. So many spices, it's all yellow. And so he looks at it, and he's like, you don't have any spices on this. And she said, uh, no, we're from Brazil, and this is just kind of how we cook. And, and he said, you must have some spices. You must have some cayenne. And she said, no, actually, I, we don't really have any in our house. And he said, you have to have some somewhere. And, and she's like, and she thought about it. And she had been told if you have a, like a little vial of cayenne, if somebody's having a heart attack, maybe it'll dilate their blood vessels. And it does dilate blood vessels. I don't know if it'll stop a heart attack or not, but there's people that suggest that. I haven't found any research, but I do know, I do know it can dilate the blood vessels. But that's a side note. So she had a tiny little vial in her purse, not for eating, just as a remedy. And he, he said, bring that to me. And then he dumped it on his food because he couldn't go one meal without spices. And so then the whole meal, he's trying to convince her, you have to eat spicy food. And um, he's, you know, a doctor, and he's sharing and sharing and sharing. By the end of the meal, they were convinced, we better start eating spicy food. So they go buy some cayenne, they start adding, and they're not used to it. And they're like, ooh, I can, that's tough. But then after a while, you get used to it. Like we read, it said that, you know, you want something stronger and still stronger, and, and you, get, you like it spicier and spicier over time. And so they became that way. And they had had a happy marriage, a happy daughter, 
And now they started having problems in their marriage. They were having problems with their daughter. They were arguing with each other. There was, there was division in the home. And as they're looking at all this, they're like, what on earth happened? And so she was, they're very spiritual. And so the wife started praying. She's like, Lord, what is it? Why on earth did we go from a happy family to like at each other's throats all the time, angry, angry? And she's like, Lord, please show me what it is. And she said that during her prayer, she said, God told me. It's the cayenne pepper. So she went to her husband and daughter and said, I was praying about why we are having so much trouble in our family. And God told me it's the cayenne. And they said, well, to be honest, when we first started eating, we didn't like it, but now I'm not so sure we want to give the stuff up. But they were spiritual too. And they said, well, if it's really from God, let's just try it. And so they cut it out of their diet. And after a while, the anger problem went away, the division in the home, the happiness came back. And these are some of the happiest people I've seen. They're just beautiful people. And we have, we have stories from around, like I said, we, we could tell you story after story. I'm not going to go on to any more. But I'm not telling you what you have to do. But if you're someone that struggles with anger, anxiety, depression, lust problems, I believe there's many people who will never gain the victory over pornography until they give up the spices. I believe there's many who will never be able to give it up, ever, until they do. It is amazing what happens. Your brain begins to, when I finally, when not only did the, the anger problem in our house, it, like we became happier people. We're not perfect, but it changed our lives. Not only did it do that, but we saw that um, for the first time in my life, meaning I had always felt like a person with an addictive personality. You used to drink heavily, you smoke. Uh, and even I had given my life to the Lord and I wasn't smoking, wasn't drinking, wasn't doing those things anymore, but I still felt like an addict just an addict who didn't do drugs or smoke anymore. But when I finally gave this up, a couple weeks after eating this way, for the first time in my life, I felt like what it must be like to be a normal human being who's not an addict. Changed my life. Absolutely changed my life. You may have some kind of other addiction. Maybe it's repetitive memories. That's not an addiction. Uh, you know, OCD. Uh, it helped me with OCD, you know, thinking the same terrible thoughts over and over. It just, it literally changed my life. So I share this not as, Thus saith the Lord, but rather, what if? What if you're struggling like we were? And it could change your life. What if? You may find out for yourself. And so I'll leave it at that. But I want to close with one beautiful thing on an absolutely positive note. I want to close with this. Talking about stress. Spicy food can make people more stressed, as we saw, but... Can reading lower stress levels? Research out of the University of Sussex looked at the effect of different activities on stress levels. Two physical reactions to stress are increased stress hormones and increasing heart rate. And the researchers had subjects in this study increase their heart rates by certain exercises or tests, and then they tried different methods of relaxation. The researchers had subjects increase their heart rates by certain exercises or tests, and then they tried different methods of relaxation. These included activities like going on a walk, listening to music, and also reading. It turned out that the most powerful method of lowering stress levels was reading. Simply reading for as little as six minutes can lower stress levels by approximately 68%, nearly 70% lower in your stress. And how long? Not 60 minutes, just six minutes. My wife and I generally, before we go to bed, we sit and read for a little bit, turn off the light. And uh, man, you just lowered your stress. Not, not like we're stressed every night, by the way. But we, you're, you, if you do have any, you lower it by nearly 70% in six minutes. Amazing. So if you think about that, and that's true. Now, God's the creator of the universe. And if that's true, don't you think it would have been nice if he would have given us a book to read? He did. God gave us the Bible, right? And the Bible says in Revelation 1, verse 3, blessed. Do you know what that word blessed means? What? Happy. My seven-year-old friend just told me. That is what it means. Little Benjamin said it's happy. Blessed means happy. When, some, when you say, how are you doing? Someone says blessed. They mean happy. True happiness. The happiness of the Lord. Notice what it says. Blessed. Happy is he that what? Read it. 
Blessed is he that reads, and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. Friends, God wants peace to be in your life. God loves you, and he wants what's best for you. I'm not telling you what you have to do, but if some, there may be a family out there. You may be, you may be in a marriage. Maybe you'll be, you're one of those families. You're just going to stick it out. You have an unhappy marriage, but you're going to stick it out. But what if it could be better? What if there could be happiness in your marriage where you actually enjoy your, each other's company? My wife and I, we actually did enjoy each other's company. It's just that we argued all the time. We didn't enjoy the arguing, but like that. I mean, we enjoyed talking, but so we liked each other, but we just had that peevish mentality. But praise the Lord. God is so wonderful what he can do in our lives. And so everything we shared this week, I hope you can take a few things away that would be a blessing to yourself. My hope is some will reverse depression maybe some lifestyle, lifestyle diseases. And also, I hope that you can be a blessing to somebody else. Let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you that you've given us natural methods of healing. Once again, we do recognize there's benefits in many of these spices, but once again, maybe you also have benefits in other plants that we don't have to have the side effects. We thank you that you care for us, that you love us, as the book of Jeremiah says, with an everlasting love, you've loved us. Lord, if there's someone here with depression like I went through, I pray that they would not give up, and that I pray that through you they'd find the victory. And maybe some of the principles we talked about, that they can implement them and find the blessings that come along with it. Yes, traumas of the past are difficult, but when our body starts functioning better as we, as we live out your health habits, Often when the body starts functioning better, the mind starts functioning better, and it makes it easier not to think about those old traumas of the past. We thank you that you've given us things that make us happier, exercise, fruits and vegetables, good rest, water, sunlight, all these blessings that are directly from you, and many of them are nearly free. Lord, thank you for your love, and I pray that you draw each one of us nearer to you. In Jesus' name, amen. How many of you want to say thank you to Chad and Fadia for coming? Yes, thank you. So their material has been uh, put away for uh, the Sabbath hours. If you wish to buy some material, it will be available tomorrow night after the meetings. Again, uh, they'll stick around here for a while. And uh, thank you for coming. Have a wonderful night. Uh, the other thing is if you are interested in a cooking class, my wife is there in the back. If you have not signed up, uh, sign up with her on the way out. And uh, we have emails of some of you for our future events. We'll never know what else is going to come up. We've got some surprises on the way. Have a tomorrow night at 6.30 p.m., okay? Have a great evening.